community and how do we recruit the ribosome? The cat binding protein, right? So we are going to recruit the ribosome here by the cat. And imagine what happens to that ribosome if it tries to move the message to get to the AUG. A connotase is in its way. The message is still made. But because aconitase is bound to that IRE, the ribosome can't translate the message. And let's think about it. If you're under iron starvation, is there really any point to making ferritin? No. Message is there, but you can't translate it. On the other hand, aconitase bound to the IRE and the 3' UTR of transferrin, this stabilizes the message. The message goes from a half-life of minutes to a half-life of hours or more. And the longer a message is around, the more times it can be translated. So now we have the transfer message is stabilized. Ribosomes can easily translate the transfer. Let's think about it. If you're under iron starvation, you may not need to store iron, but what do you need to do? You need to bring it into the cell where you need it. So it makes no sense to make ferritin because there's nothing to store, but it makes all the sense in the world to make transfer that will import the iron. Now, as iron levels climb, aconitase has a binding site for the iron cation. So as iron levels climb, aconitase binds iron. It is now released from the IRE and the ferritin message. It's released from the IRE and the transfer message. Now, ribosomes can actually translate to the start codon and keep on going. And if you think about it, it makes sense. We now have iron in the cell. We need ferritin to store it. But do we need to make any more of the transport protein? Probably not. So in the absence of the aconitase, we have cleavage by an endonuclease followed by rapid degradation of the message. So the message is unstable. So now you're making ferritin, but you're not making transfer. Now some of you may be going, well, this is really just a big waste of energy, isn't it? I mean, why should the cell waste the time and energy with RNA polymerase transcribing these genes, uh, the time and energy involved in processing the messages, getting them to the cytoplasm, if they're not going to be translated? And it's really about response time. This sort of a system controlling access or stability of the message allows a cell to respond very, very quickly to changing environmental conditions. I mean, think about it. Think of what would happen if you had an influx of iron all of a sudden. Now you need ferritin, right? If we were regulating ferritin at the transcriptional level, you would have to recruit RNA polymerase to make promoters. You'd have to transcribe the gene. You'd have to process the message. You'd have to export it to the cytoplasm. Then and only then you can make ferritin to store all this excess iron. By the same token, if iron was depleted and you wanted to make more transferrin, well, again, you have to recruit RNA polymerase, transcribe, process, export, and finally translate. By constantly making these messages and simply determining whether they can be translated or not, whether they're stable or not, it allows the cell to respond very, very quickly to changing conditions. If you had a sudden iron influx, well, now all of a sudden, the message that's already made, now it's accessible. You can very rapidly begin to make ferritin. By the same token, if iron is depleted, well, the transfer message is present, now all you have to do is stabilize it, and you can very, very quickly make transfer. There are an awful lot of genes whose product levels are regulated by regulating the accessibility of the message or the stability of the message. And it simply allows for very, very fast response times. Another, we looked at, touched upon it with the IRE, the concept of RNA degradation. Right here, when a cognitase releases, the endonuclease cleave in the IRE, Message. There are other ways that messages can be degraded. All right. Here we have a message. It has a five prime cell cap. 
It's got our protein coating, and it has a three prime UTR. In this particular transcript, we have an A-R-E, A-U rich element. A lot of messages have these embedded within the three prime UTR. Recruits an A-R-E binding protein. This in turn recruits not an endonuclease, but a three prime exonuclease. Leads to very rapid removal of the A-R-E. Even if you don't have the A-R-E, you will still see ultimate exonuclease activity removing the poly A tail. All it, it changes is how fast it is. These ones tend to see a very rapid deadenylation. These ones without the ARE, they tend to see a relatively slow deadenylation. Ultimately, however, once the poly A tail is down to about 30 adenines, you recruit decapping proteins. They come in, they remove the cap, and they also begin degrading the message from the 5' prime end. Right, so you can see here how, depending upon whether an AU-rich element is present in a 3' UTR, messages may be degraded very quickly, or they may be degraded relatively slowly. And think about it. Which one of these situations is going to give you more product, a slow or rapid deadenylation? The slow. So we have another way here of regulating the amount of times a message could be translated. Is it deadenylated very, very quickly? We rapidly reach that threshold of 30, decap, and begin degrading from the 5' prime end. Or are we deadenylated slowly? It takes a fair time to get to that 30 threshold before we decap and degrade. So this is another way of regulating the stability half-life of a message. There are also deadenylation independent pathways. We don't know exactly how they work, but they completely bypass the 3' exonuclease, and you instead go straight to the decapping and 5' degradation. We don't, so we're not sure exactly how those work, but these messages can be degraded very, very quickly, uh, even though their 3' poly tail may be intact. Generally speaking, the stability of a message can be controlled by an effector molecule. Many times these effectors are hormone. Here's some data showing you um, in some tissues or cells that make certain compounds. We're looking here at vitellogenin, ovalbumin, casein, uh, prostatic steroid binding protein. And you can see here effector molecules hormones, and the half-life of the message with the effector versus the half-life without the effector. And notice, half-life can be influenced very, very strongly by the presence or absence of some of these effector molecules. This is a very, very powerful way of controlling how much product you get from a message by controlling its stability. And again, it allows the cell to respond very, very quickly to physiologic changes. Why the message is always there, it's just how long does it last. RNA interference. This is another way of regulating post-transcriptionally. There's two variations on this. One is called mRNA-induced silencing. Am I at microRNA? Remember we talked about microRNAs when we talked about organization of the genome? These were short RNA molecules involved in gene regulation. Here's where they come into play. There is also what we call SI, or short interfering RNA-induced silencing. Both of these are mechanisms by which you don't get protein product. You get the message from the gene, but you don't get gene product from that message. We'll start with the MI, the microRNA-induced silencing. This depends upon the transcription of microRNA genes. Uh, sometimes these microRNA genes are standalone genes. Other times you find them embedded within the introns of polymerase II genes. Uh, if they are a standalone gene, as indicated here, they are capped and they are tailed, <coughs> and they will form this internal stem and loop structure. This is the pre-microRNA. 
It is processed in the nucleus by a protein called drosia. You remove the unpaired UTR here and the un uh, unpaired UTR here. So what you're left with is the stem and loop. This is what gets exported from the nucleus to the cytoplasm, where it is recognized by Dicer. Dicer removes the unpaired loop. Now we actually have two physically separate nucleotide strands still held together by hydrogen bonding. One of them is called the guide strand, one is called the passenger strand. We now load up Argo-1, sometimes called Argonaut, and you have collectively what is called the pre-MI risk complex, the pre-microRNA induced silencing complex. The passenger strand of the microRNA is degraded, and you are left with the guide strand. The guide strand is complementary to three prime UTRs in specific messages. Each microRNA is going to have its own message to which it is complementary. Right, now, what this means is the risk complex will, through hydrogen bonding, recognize the three prime UTR of a specific message. One of two things is going to happen. If, as we see here, there is an imperfect mass between the microRNA and its target, the three prime UTR, this message will be diverted to a cytoplasmic structure called the P-body, where it will be stored. It may ultimately be degraded, or it may ultimately be released for translation. But at least right now, it is not going to be translated. If, on the other hand, it is a perfect match, a one-to-one -one nucleotide correspondence between the, MI, the microRNA and its three prime UTR target, that will lead to immediate degradation. Either way, it is a way of reducing the amount of product you get from a message. Um, when these microRNAs were discovered, it was thought that they were a fairly minor way of regulating gene expression. We now know that the vast majority of messages have the potential to be regulated by a microRNA and its risk complex. The siRNA, this was actually discovered in plants. The basic, the basic idea is the same. The only difference is the source of your silencing RNA. In this case, nothing is transcribed in the nucleus. It starts with double-stranded RNA molecules in the cytoplasm. Dicer comes in and breaks these long double-stranded RNA molecules up into shorter double-strand fragments that are typically about 22 base pairs in length. And random up and down the length of this double-stranded RNA molecule. We load up again with Argo, Argo2 this time, it's essentially the same protein, and now we get an SI risk, short interfering RNA. Right? One of the two strands is discarded, and now this risk complex will hydrogen bond to the cytoplasmic RNA that corresponds to one of these two strands. It's a perfect match, and you see immediate, almost immediate degradation of the target message. This is a big player in plant defense against viruses. Right? A lot of viruses produce double-stranded RNA molecules as they proceed through their life cycle. Plants exploit that and activate this SI, short interfering RNA mechanism of shutting down the viral life cycle. Why? You derive short interfering RNA molecules from the double-stranded intermediate. They can go back and...